back to Unit 1, Part B. In Part B, I'd like to look at Chapters 2, 3, and 4 information. Now, 2, 3, and 4 have a great, you know, seems like a great number of chapters, but the coverage in it is somewhat limited. So, first thing I want you to do is take a look at the initial stages of Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, we look at the issue of what exactly are the key ingredients to valuable information. As market researchers, one of the things that we need to be able to do is determine which information out there we can use in order to help us make a decision. And the other question is, how good is that information in determining an answer that is usable by us? Well, one of the first things you'll notice is that we have a, 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 an interesting graphic in Chapter 2 that shows four of the key basic characteristics of good information. The first issue dealt, deals with the issue of relevance. How relevant is the information? If I can collect information, for example, on the town of Clarenville, and I have this great information, but my research is the town of Grand Falls, Windsor, how relevant is Clarenville's information to the town of Grand Falls, Windsor? So we need to be ensure, we need to ensure ourselves that when we collect the information that it has relevance in the sense that it deals with the area of study that we're dealing with. And that's very important. The next major issue deals with completeness, and that, that has to do with the fact that when you collect information, how much information are you collecting? Are you getting the full picture or are you only getting a partial picture? Now, in some cases, it's going to be almost impossible to get complete information. In that case, we have to assess whether or not it is sufficient enough on which to draw a conclusion. Let's say, for example, that we, uh, you're out driving along and you see a car whiz by. And then you're asked, what color was the car? Who was driving the car? How fast was the car going? Where was the car going? If those are the four questions that are so important to answer, yes, you did see the car, but do you have the full breadth of information that has been requested? Probably not. Then, you ask yourself, well, how valuable was the bit of information that you collected? You did see the car, no question. But the critical ingredients that we were looking for when we saw the car, you didn't see. So, when we're doing marketing research, we have to seek to ensure that we get as complete a, of an information package as possible. And in terms of when we're doing research, for example, from books or from the internet or from any other place, you want to ensure that you, you figure out exactly what you need, the best places to get it, and get as much of it as possible to answer the relevant questions that you have posed. The third issue in terms of this that you need to concern yourself with is the issue of quality. Good information is high quality information. When we think about quality, we're asking ourselves, how was it collected? Was it collected in a random sample so that it allowed us to get a good representation of, of the truth of what was going on? Or was it kind of a haphazard study? Haphazard studies would indicate that it's not a very high quality information, such as a, um, a radio will have every once in a while, the radio will have a, an online uh, poll. Okay, now how, how relevant are online polls to reality? Well, the fact of the matter is not very relevant because if you are asked to click in to a poll, it's only a certain type of person or a certain people that will actually click in. It won't be the representation of society. It will be a certain number of people who are engaged. So you got to ask yourself, how high quality are surveys done online, such as that you phone in, like the VOCM question of the day, for example. You cannot use that information and say, that that is high quality information that leads to a defined answer. It doesn't. High quality information usually involves using scientific principles. Um, it has to make sure that it's objective and it has to meet all the basic criteria of good quality research. The final issue that you need to concern yourself with regards to the collection of information is timeless. And that is, is the information up to date? If I were to present to you a bunch of data from 2006 right now, I have to ask you, what do you think of the timeliness of that data? And you're probably going to say to me, it isn't very timely. The fact is that that information from the point of view of 2014, 2015, 
he is getting close to 10 years old. And the very fact that it's that old says that it is not necessarily painting a picture of what's going on today. So we have to concern ourselves with when was the information gathered and how relevant is it to today. So those are the key characteristics of information, high quality information that you need in order to do effective marketing research. And that's covered in chapter two. The next topic we're studying is the various types of market research. This information is found in chapter three. We want to take a look at this very important this very important piece of information because this is something that we'll be building on throughout the course. We ask ourselves when researchers go out to look for things, information, in order to make a decision, where can we collect it? What types of things do we need to do? And this is what we consider as the types of marketing research. The very initial type of marketing research that we need to concern ourselves with is something called exploratory research. And when you think about exploratory research, what you're thinking about there is if your question that you're, you've posed to answer is something that you're totally unfamiliar with. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that I ask you to go out and find out about the history of John Franklin. Okay? Now, John Franklin was an explorer, a British explorer. You may not know that. Some of you may. But how can I ask you to get good information on John Franklin until you out, go out and find out exactly more about John Franklin? Exploratory research is really that type of research. This, to be able to get your head around the problem. You know, how can we, if, if our ultimate research project is how can we navigate through the Northwest Passage safely, you might want to study John Franklin in order to be able to ask good questions. What were some of the challenges, for example, that the Franklin Expedition faced up north? And can that information be useful for modern day explorers going through the Arctic? I'm sure you could find some things. Is finding out of John Franklin going to help you navigate the Northwest Passage in this day and age? Probably not. But an understanding of Franklin's challenges certainly would. Exploratory data and exploratory research is very preliminary data that's collected in order for us as researchers to get an idea of what we're talking about so that we can ask better questions. There are all kinds of ways of collecting exploratory research. We think about a secondary data analysis. That's a fancy word for reading books and reading stuff that already exists. This is going out, looking, finding a, what's out there, and absorbing as much of it as you can. Reading a book, watching a television show, going through literature. All these sorts of things are examples of secondary research analysis. We also may do things like pilot studies, which is just go out and, and, and do a, a little test, a little test in a little area if we're doing a certain type of research that involves some sort of experimenting or some sort of uh, survey research. A little test to see if did this kind of work, is this a way to gather this information? Uh, we can also use focus groups going out and asking people who are in the know uh, what questions we should ask. What are some of the things about this? So basically we're getting a study in it ourselves. What is it going on? So, very important for research, exploratory research is very important for research where the researchers do not have a full grasp of the problem. They need to go and find out about the problem and more about the issues surrounding the problem before they try to solve it. Usually exploratory research is found in most research projects because researchers have to have a good idea of what they're talking about and what the issues are before they actually go and address a specific problem in the research. That's step one. A second type of, of research besides exploratory research is something called descriptive research. What descriptive research tries to do is to describe the situation. Descriptive research is not necessarily numbers related, but more touchy-feely related. It's describing a scenario, describing a situation, painting a picture, as you will. The idea behind descriptive research is to describe the situation, describe the issues, describe the people involved, 
to give us to paint a much stronger picture. So we need to be able to describe what's happening. So normally, for example, we could go out as a, a study group and find out uh, why people are going to the hospital more in a certain community than they used to five years ago. That could be a very much a descriptive piece of research. We'd want to figure out who the population are, how have they changed, are they aging? Is it, is it a matter of age? Is it a matter of the hospital physically being closer to them? A new hospital may be built. Is it a matter of some um, environmental cause that is causing this? These are all what we call descriptive methods of, of research and we can actually go out and seek descriptive research fairly easily and that is to describe the situation. Descriptive research really looks to give a clear understanding or a clearer understanding of people, objects, situations, these sorts of things. So it describes characteristics related to them that would help us understand what's going on. The third type of research deals with trying to establish a cause and effect relationship. This is known as causal research. Causal research tries to determine what causes something. Is there an inherent cause? So let's say, for example, that you wanted to find out uh, if people's, um, if people, as they got older, were getting more diseased. So the question is, is their age affecting the amount of disease that people have or acquire? So we're trying to find the cause and effect relationship. Now the cause, in our case, we would consider to be age. As people age, they're more likely to have a disease. Younger people, less likely. So the cause, in this case, that we're pointing to would be age. Many other examples of causal research out there, and it tries to find the cause and effect. You know, do accidents increase on highways? as speed increases. Now one of the challenges with causal research is determining exactly what the cause is. You know, are there more than one causes? Uh, could we misidentify the cause? So these are some of the challenges that we need to consider. So when we do causal research, we have to be very careful to ensure that we try to make a direct link between the cause and effect and minimize the opportunity for something called extraneous or outside variables to come in and make that change and have us think that it was the, the original instance that caused the change. So, so let's say, for example, that people are more diseased, we're blaming it on age, when actually it could be the environment they live in, the environment that could be a, a refinery, a smokestack somewhere that are causing people to get sick. So this could be an extraneous factor. So we need to consider, when we do a cause and effect relationship, to minimize the amount of potential for extraneous variables or outside events to cause the change that we're trying to study. Next I'd like to talk about a very important topic in this and that is the stages of the research process. The purpose of doing marketing research is to find answers to the questions that we have about events that could change the course of how we run our business. In order to be able to do a really good job of this we need to say is there a process to be able to do marketing research that we can use consistently to encourage us to and, and to enhance the quality of the information we collect? Well, research has shown that generally we can use a simple process and this process is something that's outlined in this book in the course and something that kind of lays out um, a roadmap of where we're going in the course. So the first thing we should have available to us whenever we do marketing research is a good handle on what exactly we're looking for, the problem. What exactly is the problem we are trying to consider? And when we think about the problem, we need to ask ourselves, what is it as a company that is puzzling us that marketing research could potentially help answer? That's what we define as the problem. We, we need to, in terms of the problem, is to lay out some very clear research objectives. If we are going to do research to address that problem, what are the specific things we want that research to do? And these things are laid out as objectives. In other words, at the end of the process, we will go back and we will ask ourselves, 
Did we meet the objectives that we set out? So, our research objectives are absolutely critical to determine. So let's assume that we're a business and we want to see if there is a large enough market in the town that we're thinking about setting up in for our business. That's the problem. Is the town big enough? Okay. Is the market big enough? Our objectives we need to clearly lay out to say, okay, we need to make sure that there is a market of 30,000 people in order to set up. We need to ensure that 50% of those people would consider shopping in our store. We also need to set up as an objective that each one of those people will be willing to spend at least a hundred dollars a year in our store. And these specific objectives then are, are really kind of setting the stage for how, what questions we should ask, how we should ask the questions, the types of things that we need to know. At the end of all the research, we're going to go back and say, did the research answer those questions? And ultimately, did it answer them positively? Did we make enough money? Is the population big enough? Are people willing to shop there? And if the answers to all those are yes, then it's a good indication we should actually set up our store there. So again, we've more or less answered the questions that our problem statement has laid out. Is the town big enough for us to set up a store? So the first, with the first stage of the, the marketing research problem taken care of, we've got our objective set. Then we go out and we say to ourselves, let's look at how we're actually going to collect that information. How are we going to do that now? We've got those questions to ask. How are we going to do it? This is what we call the research design stage, which is the next critical stage. That's where we sit down and we actually plot out a strategy for how we're going to collect the information that will be used to answer those objectives. So, for example, we could say, okay, one of the things that we need to do in order to collect that information is to do a survey. Okay, good. That's the basic design then. Let's make a survey. So we go through a process of developing a good quality survey in order to answer those specific objective questions, always keeping in mind the objectives that we set at the first stage. Then we move on. We actually now, how are we going to, if we're going to do a survey, how are we going to collect the information? Who's going to, who's going to do the survey, basically? So if we give it to all our friends, will that give us good information? If we give it to all our enemies, will that give us good information? If we give it to our competitors. So we need to design a way that we can get what's called a representative sample. We can't interview everybody in the town with the survey. We need to be able to say there is a select few people, a large enough, what we call sample, that we can go and we can make a determination based on a sample. And that sample wants to represent the population as a whole. We want to be able to get an information from that sample that would tell us with good probability that the town is big enough, people would buy enough, and that they'd be willing to support us in such a way that our business would be feasible. The sampling process is a good part of this course. How do we do that? Where do we do that? What methods do we use? We'll be looking at later on. Once we've got it, we've done our sample, then we've got all, you can imagine, individual surveys and they're all stacked on a desk. We need to take those individual surveys and analyze them. So if we got a hundred surveys back, we have to look at each one and say, what did people say? That's what we mean by analysis. We take all the individual surveys and we compile them so that we can get an answer. Fifty percent of the people said they would shop in our store. Seventy percent of the people said they, they would spend a hundred dollars each. These sorts of things. So we need to be able to collect that information and analyze that information. And based on the analysis, then we move to the next stage, which is, anal uh, is boiling it down so that we have the answers to our research. So if we've asked the question, you know, is the town big enough? Will people shop there enough? That research and that analysis, we take it all together and we write it up. We basically create a, a, a report. And the report draws our conclusions. It says, the town is large enough for us, we should move there. Or it could alternately say, the town is not big enough, let's not move there. 
So again, the marketing research process is a very straightforward process, but it is very scientific in how it does what it does. It uses it uses a clear understanding of, of scientific principles, objective measurement, in order to get a good response. So that's that. Next we're looking at how the issue of how marketing research is actually conducted in a practical sense in an organization or in a contract organization. Let's take a look at it first. Generally we recognize that we have to collect marketing research in order to make better decisions. The ultimate question that many firms have is should we do that in-house or should we ask another firm to do the marketing research for us? And there's pluses and minuses to both. If we do it in-house, the advantage there is that we keep all our information to ourselves. So it provides a great test of or testament to the security of the information. No one else can see it because we're the ones collecting it. The downside is though we have to create a whole entity within our firm to be able to collect and gather and manipulate and manage and store and decipher information. For some organizations that's just too much so they really have no choice but to go external to it. So if we look at small organizations, the majority of the marketing research they, they conduct is done with the help of an outside agency. These outside agencies are designed specifically to collect data. They are experts in the field, they have the people who know how to collect data, how to analyze data, and report data in such a way that it's most useful to a firm. There are costs involved in that, and firms have to weigh it out with, again, the idea of doing it internally. In terms of the setup of a research department, be it internal or external in an organization, the the, the basic gist is that you have a, a someone who's responsible for the overall marketing research effort, and that's usually a, a supervisor or a manager of marketing research. That manager of marketing research then is responsible for overseeing the people who actually collect the research. And we could actually look at those people and divide them into a number of categories. There could be people who are responsible for collecting marketing research with regards to uh, from customers, with regards to from a marketing perspective, with regards to a financial perspective, with regards to a quality perspective. All kinds of different perspectives could be taken. So depending on how large the organization is or the specialty is of the organization, different people will fill different roles within that marketing research environment. Now, sometimes most organizations will say, you know, the, the idea, if we're getting large enough, as we get large enough, a lot of organizations will say we need to develop our own capacity in-house. If they do that, oftentimes what they do is they draw from various departments. This is known as a cross-functional team. The cross-functional team are people who are drawn from various departments of the organization representing accounting, finance, marketing, sales, all together that will allow them to bring many different perspectives to a situation. So it's important from a marketing research point of view that we're aware that marketing research can be done internally or externally, and in any sense, regardless of how it's done, different people will take different roles within that environment. Ultimately, the goal is to collect the best possible information for the firm so that we can make the best possible decisions. The final section in this unit that we need to look at deals with the issue of ethics and ethical standards. Now, the concept of ethics is something that deals with the, the morals or the behavior of you, the firm, the organization, the department, in terms of how you operate, and do you meet a certain standard that is acceptable in society? Morals and ethics are very important in business today because we have seen many examples of businesses that have not applied proper ethical behavior and gotten in trouble for it. So most businesses today try to adhere to a certain ethical standard. These standards range between ideal standards talk about that in terms of moral idealism. And ideal standards means to be absolutely ethical no matter what. It ranges between that and relativism. And when we look at relativism, what we're looking at there is being ethical to the point that we are practically ethical. Like for example, you could imagine driving your car moral idealists would say, well, driving your car is unethical because it pollutes the environment. 
However, we have to say, well, yeah, that, that is certainly true, no doubt about it, but I still need to get to work or to school. So relativism, or uh, it, it kind of says, relatively, the benefits that I get are more than the damage that I create. So as a result, relatively, it is ethical to drive to work or to drive to school. Whenever we think of rights and obligations and ethical behavior in marketing research, one of the things we need to consider is who are the players involved? And when we look at the players involved in marketing research, uh, we, we really think about three major players. First of all, there is the research organization. It is the organization that's actually conducting the research. Second, we have the people who the research is being conducted on, the research ease, more or less, the people that are the subjects of what is being researched. The third player is often considered as a client. The, the organization that's buying the research or the, the objective. Let's just take a second to go through the graphic that I'm going to put up on the screen right now. If you look at this, the green area represents the society as a whole and ethical obligations extend beyond the, the parties involved but to society. We need to ensure that whenever we conduct certain things that we do it ethically and for the benefit of society. But more specifically we can look at what is the client obligation if we look at the client obligation, the obligation is there to seek only legitimate bids. If we are a firm going after a research firm uh, to seek a research firm to do some research for us, we must seek legitimate firms that do legitimate research. That's our first obligation. Our second obligation is to have an open discussion, tell them exactly what we need. What are we looking for? What are our major objectives? We should have that clear in our head before we ever go to seek uh, a firm. We should pay for all the work completed. Obviously, if we kind of shortchange them and this sort of thing, that questions the ethics of our behavior. We should look at uh, not uh, not to be trying to sell stuff with our with our you know the purpose of our research to collect the information, not to sell stuff. And uh, we we can't ask for something called pseudo research, which is a disguised form of research. So we're doing the research, which is really disguised for some other reason that we're not clear on or we're not obviously clear on. From a participant obligation, the participant is obliged to keep the information truthful. So if, if the participant is giving information to the researcher, make sure that it's the truth. And that way the participant does his or her duty in terms of giving information. And uh, must be responsible for participation. The participant's job is really to, to give the information as freely and truly as possible. And the concept of informed consent is important. You need to know what you're doing when you're when you're giving this information. What's it going to be used for? How is it going to be collected? What are the implications of it? We also look at the basic researcher obligation from the client's right point of view. Well, we have to have an open discussion with the client. We have to maintain confidentiality. We have to be honest in reporting of results and errors and limitations of our research. So. We want to be totally honest here. We want to avoid conflict of interest, so we're not sharing that private information with other firms. From the participant rights, we, we should look at making sure that the participant has informed consent. Again, uh, has a clear understanding of what the information is being collected for and how it's going to be used. Uh, the right to privacy. The right not to be coerced or forced into giving an answer or to, to relaying information a right to protection from harm, a right to make sure the research is worthy of value. Uh, is this research useful to the firm, is it useful to society, or is it just disguised research in the sense of it's designed for some other purpose that is not clear? And uh, again, not to make selling and research. So that graphic is a good indicator of of the three parties involved and some of the rights and obligations that they share to one another.